Well, thank you for that um, kind introduction, and also thank you to inviting me to speak at this conference. It's mostly genetics people, and so I'm going to try and uh, talk to you about the fifth base that's in DNA, uh, the epigenetic changes that are very important in development of cancer, and how we can use this as tools, actually as personalizing the medicine there. So first of all, I'm going to give you a little background because nobody else is going to speak on this. Um, DNA methylation changes are specifically what I'm going to be focusing on, and in addition to all the genetic alterations we, we know that exist in cancer, changes in DNA methylation are a fundamental and driving force in the development of cancer. And this is very simplistically shown here, uh, where we have CPG denucleotides shown as open circles here, um, and in the normal setting, the promoter's regions of genes are, are protected from this methylation, that's why they're shown open, and transcription can occur. But in critical genes in the development of cancer, there is uh, dense DNA methylation that occurs here, and this transcriptionally silences DNA uh, the, the genes and functionally turns off uh, tumor suppressor genes in cancer. Now, just a very, uh, uh, one of the challenges we have uh, facing us in epigenetics is that DNA methylation is not a, one of the normal bases. It's a modification. And most of the current approaches that are used take advantage of a chemical trick using sodium bisulfite. This deaminates cytosines to uracils, but methylcytosine is protected from this. And therefore, we essentially convert a, an epigenetic change into a genetic sequence change that then uh, allows us to use all the tools, genomic sequencing, showing here that if a region is unmethylated, we get one sequence. And if it's methylated, we retain these CBGs and get another. And we can also then develop PCR-based strategies to detect these uh, methylation changes, converting essentially epigenetic into genetic material. Now, a, a quick example of this. Now, let me go back. This is uh, one of the, uh, an older example of DNA methylation changes that occur in cancer. APC is a gene that we know that's commonly mutated in cancer, but only about 80% of colon cancers mutate this gene. Uh, the uh, other subset actually transcriptionally silence it, and that's shown here. Uh, this is a tumor from a patient that with, where DNA methylation is shown in red. This is the normal tissue from the patient. This is their cancer. This is another patient's cancer that's densely methylated, and here's a patient that's not. And so we now get a molecular signature at the level of DNA methylation that allows us to, first of all, uh, show what's going on, and then use this as a tool for detection. Now, this is uh, the, the consequences of DNA methylation. This is APC again. These are polyps, so it occurs very early in the development of cancer. Here are polyps where we can de detect DNA methylation, shown in tumors 2, 4, uh, 5, and 7, and these are transcriptionally silenced. Now, this provides an alternative way to inactivate tumor suppressor genes, and this has been well documented for 20 or 30 different tumor suppressor genes and many other genes of cancer. What I want to focus on is how we now use this information to change the therapy and how do we personalize it, because some tumors have one phenotype and some tumors have another. Now here's the other uh, daunting task that we faced us. So we know that by sequencing tumors, we're finding an increasing number of changes in, at the mutational level, but this is the, these are the DNA methylation changes present in squamous cell cancers of the lung. In a, in a project that uh, Dr. Green just previously mentioned, the TCGA, I just used this to highlight a couple of things. Number one, um, I'm, I'm showing here this is a heat map with methylation where high methylation is blue and low methylation is black. These are all the normal tissues from the lung. Each, each individual column is a, is a tumor, or I'm sorry, normal, and these are the tumors. And what you can see is a couple of things. Number one, there's tremendous heterogeneity between the tumors. All these tumors actually have a different uh, somatically acquired DNA methylation pattern that's here. Uh, but there's also hundreds to thousands of changes that are present in individual tumors. And this re represents both the opportunity and the challenge that we face today. The other thing that I'd like to point out is the epigenome is very stable in normal tissues. These are all the normal tissues from about 50 different patients. They're all the same, but all the tumors are different. So how do we exploit this? Because there's many different changes that we could potentially look at. Now, one of the ways that we've uh, um, approached this is to, to look the same way that mutational changes have been used to target therapies. Uh, this is, again, from that same paper. These are the mutational alterations. And when we know the specific mutations that are present in the tumors, there's the potential to use these for targets. Now, one of the challenges in squamous cell cancer is that the frequently mutated genes like P53, P10, and P16 are really not targetable by therapies we have today. But this approach has been used successfully in, uh, in lung, other lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, where we use EGFR inhibitors based on EGFR mutations. But if we know the patterns of mutations, can we also use the patterns of DNA methylation to target specific therapies and understand how they work? So here's an example of, of one that uh, has, has been very well demonstrated, and this is a gene called methylguanine methyltransferase. 
This is a gene where some tumors express high levels of MGMT, other tumors, in this case a brain tumor, it does not express any MGMT. Here's a colon tumor that expresses and one that doesn't, and here's a lymphoma. And in each of these cases, the tumors that do not express MGMT have transcriptionally silenced the gene through promoter region methylation that we can now detect very readily. So what does this mean in terms of the outcomes and for patients? Here's a, a study that we conducted a few years ago where we looked at MGMT promoter methylation and, and predict, using this to predict the survival of patients who received a therapy called uh, carmustine or BCNU. This is an alkylating agent that is specifically repaired by MGMT and therefore loss of MGMT expression through promoter region methylation leads to an improved outcome. This is overall survival. Uh, again, all these patients were otherwise identical, but there was an increase in survival of the patients that had an MGMT methylation in silence compared to those that it wasn't. And this is also progression-free survival. So a consistent pattern that allows us to now suggest that we can use this for therapeutic uh, uh, direction of different therapies. A few years later, Monica Hagee confirmed this with a drug temozolomide. This is the currently most useful drug. It's the only really approved drug in brain tumor treatment. It's another alkylating agent, and like BCNU or carmustine, this is specifically repaired by MGMT. And what they were able to demonstrate is the presence of MGMT methylation correlated with response and improved survival compared to this. So this is now one specific promoter region methylation change that allows us to distinguish patients that will benefit from uh, treatment with temozolomide versus those that will not. Now, this can potentially be then applied to other tumors. While brain tumors have a well-documented uh, and, and robust response to alkylating agents, um, other tumors this has been explored to uh, a focus on. And again, out of the Sloan Kettering group, uh, Mark Chris and Lee uh, Krugan and colleagues uh, demonstrated that in small cell lung cancer, a tumor where temozolomide has, has not been approved, it is not commonly used, uh, they were able to demonstrate that there, there is a clinical response. So this is a waterfall plot. These are patients that don't respond to the therapy. And in contrast, these are patients that did. And what I want to focus on here, really, is their finding that, in fact, in this paper, the uh, presence of methylation of MGMT was detected in about uh, half of the patients uh, in this group. And the response rate was 40% in the patients that had methylation of MGMT and 7% in those that are not. So again, this confirms in a separate tumor type that there is indeed the possibility of directing therapy according to the molecular phenotype of altered DNA methylation at this single gene. Okay. So now let's go back to this. Now, it, buried in here is uh, MGMT methylation, and it's um, uh, maybe the people in the front row can see it, but the ones in the back probably can't. No, not really. There's really no way to pick this gene out of this uh, very large group of alterations that are there. And so we continue to need to, to focus on the biology of what these genes are doing and how they direct the phenotype. And another example where this is potentially useful is a gene called the checkpoint 4 ked gene. This is another gene uh, that was shown to be inactivated uh, with loss of expression in certain cancer cell lines shown here. And the importance of this is this creates a phenotype that sensitizes cells to things that affect the microtubule. In this case, nacotazole, so putting the gene back in rescues the phenotype, but tumors that are lacking in CHFR undergo apoptosis when treated with a taxane. Uh, and this is taxane here. So again, it shows that a phenotype is directly related to this alteration. Uh, and the uh, alteration is actually due to DNA methylation and silencing of this as well. Now, it turns out that in esophageal cancer, this gene is frequently uh, methylated. About 40% of primary esophageal cancers have silencing of DNA and DNA methylation of the checkpoint 4 ked gene. And we can convert um, either a gel-based or a real-time PCR assay to very simply, with one PCR, answer the question of, is the tumor methylated or not? These tumors are methylated. This patient is not. And then when we look at those patients for their potential response to therapy and outcome, what we see is this is the uh, outcome of patients that receive the targeted therapy that's, that is associated with loss of expression of CHFR, in this case, taxane, either docetaxel or paclitaxel. Here's the survival of the patients that have the sensitive phenotype, and here's the survival of those that have the resistance. So like MGMT silencing, this creates a phenotype that makes uh, the cells vulnerable to specific drugs. When we look at other drugs, in this case, when we don't use a taxane and these patients were treated without a taxane, there's no difference in survival. So this is truly a predictive test, not a prognostic test affecting just the tumor phenotype, but allows us to potentially um, target patients for um, moving treatment. Now, this can also, in some cases, be done by expression analysis, and this is also shown in lung cancer, where we see some tumors uh, express low levels of CHFR and others less express high levels. 
But once again, what we see is that the, in this case, the expression or the DNA methylation creates a sensitive phenotype. This is in a, uh, independent co uh, a pri primary cohort where we see, again, the low expression associated with DNA methylation as uh, associated with a better outcome when treated with a taxane. This is now in metastatic lung cancer. And uh, in, in, in a validation cohort, again, the, really the same phenotype is seen. So this begins to uh, widen our perspective on the number of alterations that are, are changing in addition to those genes that are potentially uh, methylated or, or, or mutated and, and activated, one can begin to explore uh, silencing and DNA methylation as another alternative. Now, we'd, we had, uh, the first shot I showed you of CHFR methylation was actually in colorectal cancer. Uh, this confirms, in fact, that the silencing of, of, of CHFR and the loss of expression is due to promoter region methylation, again, just a PCR-based effort. And those tumor cell lines that are DNA methylation express absolutely no, uh, it, this is RNA or also at the protein level. There's no CHFR in these tumors. Now, why didn't I start this story with colorectal cancer? And the reason is that colorectal cancer is not a disease that's commonly treated, it's not treated at all with taxanes because in early uh, uh, clinical development of these agents, a, a, a response was not seen. And it turns out that most tumors actually have this phenotype, that's the resistant phenotype, and only a small subset have the silenced or sensitive phenotype. So we've tested that in vitro, and we find out, in fact, that CHFR silencing and DNA methylation leads to a, um, an increase in sensitivity. So these are the four cell lines that lose expression and are silenced, and at very low levels, low nanomolar levels, we see lethality to these cancer cell lines, as opposed to the cancer cell lines that express it, which have much higher um, uh, IC50s or inhibitory of those 50s. And the interesting thing about CHFR methylation is it actually correlates with a phenotype, and that's concordant with microsatellite instability. And this potentially explains why the earlier studies failed to find um, a clinical benefit to, uh, uh, to the taxanes in colorectal cancer, because microsatellite instability is a relatively uncommon phenotype in colon cancer, and it's also associated with lack of metastatic disease in most cases. So those trials were all underpowered to see any effect of the taxanes. But we do find CHFR methylation is present, and, and it coincides again with the other cause of microsatellite instability, which is silencing of this mismatch repair MLH1. So why does this matter? Well, microsatellite unstable lines through silencing of uh, MLH1 in most cases are also more sensitive to a, dis, uh, a, a, a drug, gemcitabine, which is related to uh, DNA repair, uh, or at least sensitized by lack of DNA repair. And so again, we have a sensitive phenotype created by the silencing of, uh, of MLH1 that coincides to gemcitabine. And so when we combine these, we can again test before we move this back into patients. We can test and confirm that, in fact, colon cancer cell lines that are, um, uh, have the resistant phenotype to both of these, so they have expression of CHFR and expression of MLH1. When treated with docetaxel and gemcitabine, there is no response to this tumor at all in a xenograft study. And, but in contrast, this cell line, when put into a mouse and treated with um, either docetaxel or gemcitabine, is markedly sensitive to, this is the survival or the tumor uh, volume of the uh, tumors in the patients, or the, the xenografts, rather. And what you can see is really there's a marked inhibition of growth of the tumors, specifically in the phenotype that's sensitive to this. So the way to now go back is to now screen for this phenotype. And we have a phase two trial. We're selecting for microsatellite instability and the, the CHFR methylation phenotype. And these patients are getting a regimen that is not standard for colorectal cancer, but based on this selective phenotype, it should be effective in that. And again, we're, we're selecting patients that can be now potentially targeted with drugs and regimens, which we know how to safely give. This is a regimen we commonly give in many other tumor types. So we know how to give the drugs. They're, they're approved. They're available. They're just not typically given for this disease. And so we can go back and begin to expand the uses, as you heard this morning, of using Herceptin in colorectal cancer. Again, in the same way, we're targeting a sensitive phenotype, in this case through lack of expression of these critical genes. And we're looking at see if this can improve the survival. Now, I'm just going to conclude here. What's that? What's that? I'm going to conclude here. Yeah, I'm done. My last slide. Uh, <laughs> so it, the epigenetic alterations include many different pathways, and these potentially sensitize to different agents. I mentioned MGMT, and then MLH1 creates a resistant phenotype to DNA repair uh, uh, proteins in some cases. BRCA1 gets silenced in a number of cancers and sensitizes to platinum-based agents and PARP inhibitors, and we can screen patients for this, and we have a trial in leukemia looking at this, finding the rare events that are there. Again, there are some other genes that potentially are silenced. I showed CHFR. And there are other apoptotic genes that potentially create either resistance or sensitive phenotypes, depending on these alterations. And so by combining epigenetic alterations with the genetic alterations that we find that may direct other therapies, we can sensitize or, or find out the sensitivity of patients beforehand and pick therapies optimally for their management. 
And let me just, I'll just close with acknowledgments and uh, disclose that I'm a consultant to a company, MDX, who's trying to uh, develop these and uh, use, use for patient diagnostics. So thank you very much.